Welcome to the 2020 Phi Beta Kappa Book Awards. I'm Lynn Pascarella, the president of the Phi Beta Kappa Society. This is one of my favorite events of the year. And while I miss getting together over dinner, I'm delighted that we can be together virtually this evening to celebrate three extraordinary books and pay tribute to their authors. I want to begin our program by recognizing the members of the 2018 to 2021 Phi Beta Kappa Committee on Awards and the entire Phi Beta Kappa staff for their extraordinary work, not only in preparing for this event, but for every day of the year. The unprecedented challenges of this past year resulting from the worst global pandemic in more than a century and from an economic recession leading to the highest unemployment rate since the Great Depression, coinciding with a moment of racial reckoning in America and the turmoil and discord of a contentious election illustrate why the distinctively American tradition of liberal education at the heart of Phi Beta Kappa's mission is not only appropriate to democracy, but essential to fostering the sustained engagement of free individuals committed to our shared values of justice, liberty, human dignity, and the equality of persons. The fundamental democratic ends are fortified by liberal education's emphasis on evidence-based reasoning encouraging dialogue across difference, cultivating rational debate, and engendering the habits of heart and mind that both equip students and disposes them to civic involvement in the creation of a more just and inclusive society. There's no one more fitting to lead us in furthering our objectives than Phi Beta Kappa's 10th secretary and CEO, Fred Lawrence. Fred and I were both presidents of small liberal arts colleges in Massachusetts at the same time. And in the decade that I've known him, I benefited from his legal scholarship, witnessed his tireless advocacy for Phi Beta Kappa's mission and been moved by his deep and abiding commitment to racial and social justice. Since assuming office in 2016, Fred has raised the visibility of Phi Beta Kappa, traveling around the country, invigorating our chapters and associations lobbying Congress on behalf of the arts and humanities, championing freedom of expression on campuses and shaping public opinion through op-eds, <clears throat> podcasts, radio and television appearances. When the founders of our society came together in the Raleigh Tavern on December 5th, 1776, they saw an intellectual fellowship grounded in friendship and morality. Fred honors this legacy every day of his life in all that he does and I'm so privileged to have him as a colleague. Please join me in welcoming Secretary Fred Lawrence. Thank you, Lynn, for your leadership and your support and your friendship and all you've done for Phi Beta Kappa and liberal education, including at your day job running the American Association of Colleges and Universities. We, we borrow a lot of your time these days uh, uh, in your role as board chair at Phi Beta Kappa. We're deeply grateful for all that you do. This is how we celebrate at Phi Beta Kappa. This is how we mark our birthday, as it were. As Lynn said, our founding was December 5th, 1776. So this Saturday will actually mark 244 years uh, in the history of Phi Beta Kappa and the role that we've played in American society, which is extraordinary and singular. Uh, I can think of no better way of capturing that than in the words of one of Lynn's predecessors, uh, the legendary historian, John Hope Franklin. This is what John Hope Franklin wrote in 1989 uh, about Phi Beta Kappa. He, he asked, how is it that an organization with relatively obscure and inauspicious beginnings and with nothing much in the way of a power base is able to enjoy considerable respect and a reasonable amount of influence. Surely one reason is that for more than two centuries, Phi Beta Kappa has stood at the highest, for the highest academic and intellectual standards. In a country, he said, that historically has placed such great stock in material and practical things, its people have always been able to muster some respect, however grudging at times, for things that exalt the mind and the spirit. The very age of Phi Beta Kappa, Franklin said, invites veneration, to be sure. And in a nation given to symbols, nothing epitomizes excellence more than an honor society born just five months after Thomas Jefferson wrote the Declaration of Independence. So how fitting 244 years later, uh, we gather virtually uh, because of the conditions in which we face ourselves, showing that some things 
last, some things transcend, uh, and some things have to transport and change. And we represent all of that in Phi Beta Kappa. And so tonight we celebrate, we celebrate what is the, the best in the liberal arts and sciences. And it is my great honor, and I agree with Lynn, it is one of the great nights of the year for us to present the recipients of the three Phi Beta Kappa Book Awards. Each award will be presented in the order of establishment of that award. And after the presentation of each award, we'll have the opportunity to hear from each winner. After those awards are presented, we're gonna have a panel uh, question and answer uh, session with the authors in which I will engage in conversation with them. And then you will have a chance to ask questions uh, through the chat function. And we'll pose some of those questions as time permits to our three recipients. This year, we're gonna continue a practice that we started last year with great success. Uh, the discussion that we have with our three panelists uh, who are our three award winners, our three recipients, uh, will be one episode of the Key Conversations with Phi Beta Kappa podcast. Uh, Key Conversations with Phi Beta Kappa uh, is now, uh, after three seasons, uh, found its place in the conversation of the liberal arts and sciences. I'm delighted to welcome uh, our honorees tonight to Key Conversations, and I would be especially delighted to welcome all of you to listen to Key Conversations. If you're not a regular listener, you can get it wherever you get your, your podcast and join us on Key Conversations with Phi Beta Kappa. I do want to express my particular thanks to Virginia Laura, our uh, producer tonight, to my colleague Hadley Kelly uh, for her work on the podcast, and especially to the incomparable Jaleka Lentigua Williams, uh, who was with us from the beginning uh, and played an instrumental role in helping me launch the podcast. I also want to thank our two anonymous donors who make Key Conversations possible. You know who you are. I hope you're both listening tonight. If one of you can't, uh, then my prayers are with you and your spouse. During the question and answer portion, um, as I said, we'll take questions from the audience. So be thinking about those even as they give their remarks at the beginning and submit those questions in the chat. I also want to join Lynn in thanking the Phi Beta Kappa Book Award Selection Committee. And finally, a word of thanks to all the members of the Secretary Circle uh, who are with us uh, tonight uh, or this afternoon, depending on what time zone you're in and possibly even this morning. Finally, before we get started, I have to tell you how we're going to end. Uh, every year, those of you who are regular attenders know that we have a raffle. Well, it's a little harder to do this year. I can't ask you to look under your plate and find a number. So instead, I'm going to ask what is called in my script a Phi Beta Kappa trivia question. I have to tell you, I prefer to think of it as Phi Beta Kappa history, uh, not Phi Beta Kappa trivia, but I guess that's in the eye of the beholder. But I'll ask a Phi Beta Kappa history question, and the first three people to uh, to go into the chat with the correct answer. Uh, we'll uh, each win a prize. That'll be our raffle tonight. So uh, that's your tease to stick around till the end. So let's get started with our uh, first award, which is the Christian Gauss Award, which is the oldest of the three Phi Beta Kappa book awards. It was established by the Phi Beta Kappa Senate back in 1950 to recognize outstanding books in the field of literary scholarship or literary criticism. Christian Gauss was a distinguished scholar himself at Princeton University, teacher and dean. He also served as a senator for Phi Beta Kappa and was also, uh, like John Hope Franklin and Lynn Pascarella, uh, a president of the Phi Beta Kappa Society. The winning title of the Phi Beta Kappa Christian Gauss Award this year is What We Talk About When We Talk About Books, The History and Future of Reading by Leah Price, published by Basic books. Mark Twain famously remarked that the report of his death had been greatly exaggerated. And perhaps the same can be said of the long predicted death of books. Leah Price has presented us with a challenging good news, bad news story. It seems we're reading as much as we ever did, but maybe we never read as much as we thought we did. Still, the world that she describes and celebrates is a bookish world to be sure. Books continue to play a central role in our lives, even in the format that has changed over time to include the various electronic devices on which many of us experience our reading today. Harvard Phi Beta Kappa chapter president, Maya uh, Jasanoff put it just right. She said, Leah Price's contagious 
Delight in Books makes this book a delight. Leah Price is the Henry Rutgers Distinguished Professor of English at Rutgers University. At Rutgers, she founded the Initiative for the Book. She writes for the New York Times Book Review, London Review of Books, San Francisco Chronicle, the New York Review of Books, and many others. She's the author of How to Do Things with Books in the Victorian uh, Britain and the Anthology and the Rise of the Novel. It is a great pleasure to present the 2020 Phi Beta Kappa Christian Gauss Award to Dr. Leah Price. Now, this is the moment when I would have handed her something. I can't quite do that, but I think I can virtually pass this off. Leah, this will find its way framed to you. Uh, congratulations on your winning the 2020 Christian Gauss Award. Would you honor us with some remarks? Thank you so much, Fred. And thank you for the promise of a hunk of paper because like paper books, paper certificates have a certain kind of sentimental value. Um, I'm very grateful to Fred and to Lynn and to the judges of this prize. And because what we talk about when we talk about books is in part a plea for readers and book lovers to notice the material objects through which our intellectual experiences are vehicled and to notice that those objects are made by whole sets of human hands. It is only right to thank all those people whose hands have gone into the making of this book. I can't name them all, but I would like to thank Alison McKean, who commissioned this book, Lara Heimert, who edited and published it, and Maya Silber, now a brilliant historian in her own right, who worked on it as an, as an undergraduate research assistant, and especially all the librarians and booksellers who have given it space on their on their shelves and in their minds. We have probably all thought about the ways in which during this pandemic, some doors have closed for the book and other doors have opened. I tried to argue in when we talk, what we talk about when we talk about books, that the book has become a not smartphone a recipient for all our hopes and fantasies about a world beyond social media. In the last few months, you might say that the book has become a not Zoom. So leaving aside the irony of the format of this particular ceremony, it may be worth thinking about current debates among legislators worldwide about whether to count bookstores as an essential business. Should bookshops be open during lockdowns? And not just bookstores. In this country, some big box chains have roped off their paperback aisles, even as the aisles selling lentils and hair dye and flour have remained open. And likewise for a well-known e-commerce retailer that got its start with books as its proof of concept, but which has now pushed books to the back of the logistics queue in order to prioritize what it considers essential goods including peripherals such as earphones and ring lights. So on the one hand, doors have closed for the book. On the other hand, the book is looming larger than ever in our imaginations. Stay safe, read books, run the masks sold by one independent bookstore. And we've seen a meteoric rise in ebook and audiobook downloads during the pandemic, both from bookstores and also from public libraries. 
So I'm heartened by this vote of confidence in the book. And I'm very much looking forward to hearing about my two co-awardees books. Back to you, Fred. Thank you, Leah. And thank you for, uh, for making a passionate case for, for books. I, I think it's fair to say that, uh, that tonight uh, or this afternoon or this morning, uh, you, you are preaching to the choir. Uh, this is Phi Beta Kappa. We tend to take books pretty seriously. Uh, but you know, there's nothing wrong with preaching to the choir. The choir tends to say amen, and that's nice once in a while. So congratulations, and, and thank you for your, your wonderful words in the book, and thank you for your wonderful words uh, with us at this, um, at this ceremony. Uh, our next award is the Phi Beta Kappa Award in Science, which was established in 1959 to encourage literate and scholarly, scholarly interpretations of the physical and biological sciences and of mathematics. I'd like to remind people that we typically say liberal arts and sciences because when people hear liberal arts, they tend to think of the humanities, the arts, maybe they think of the social sciences or maybe not even that. But the fact is those who really know what the liberal arts are and what liberal arts means understand that the expression liberal arts and sciences is actually redundant. If you were to say to the Greeks that the, you have to add sciences, they would have said, well, biology, chemistry, physics, mathematics, archaeology, these are the liberal arts. These are the liberal arts. And they combine in the winner of this year's Phi Beta Kappa Award in Science, Archaeology from Space, How the Future Shapes the Past by Sarah Parsek. Space archaeology, it sounds like an oxymoron. What connects us more to our ancient and even prehistoric past than archaeology? And what sounds more futuristic than space exploration? But in Sarah Parsik's hands, we learn that space archaeology is hardly an oxymoron. It is an essential bridge in understanding our past and visualizing our future. Space archaeology uses path-breaking remote sensing technology that has opened up extraordinary discoveries from ancient civilizations across the globe. In this book, we learn of long forgotten roads, fortresses, whole settlements. If we are to preserve our shared global past and learn vital lessons from those who came before us and with whom we in fact share genetic materials and share some fundamental and basic traits, then space archeology span will play a vital role and Sarah Parsak will be our guide. Sarah Parsak is a National Geographic Society Archaeology Fellow, Fellow of the Society of Ant Antiquaries, and a 2013 TED Senior Fellow, and a 2016 uh, TED recipient, right? Um, uh, Sarah serves as the founding director of the Laboratory for Global Observation at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. She and her husband, Egyptologist Greg Mumford, work together on the surveys and excavation projects in Egypt. She has written the first textbook on the field of satellite archaeology and has published numerous peer-reviewed scientific papers. She has worked with NASA and the U.S. State Department and has academic collaborators across the globe. It is my privilege to present the Phi Beta Kappa Award for Science to Dr. Sarah Parsek. Thank you. And Sarah, you, you too get a, a, a certificate suitable for framing, which will be delivered to you. Thank you. All right. Sarah, would you like to share some words with us? Thank, thank you so much, Fred. Thank you so much, uh, Lynn and, and everyone at Phi Beta Kappa. Uh, this is such an honor to all the honored guests, family and friends. You know, this is a, obviously we're, we're experiencing um, uh, an unusual uh, presentation event, but in, in some ways it's, it's magical because it's a way for so many more people to, to come together and, and celebrate. Um, I wouldn't be here 
tonight without a long line of extraordinary teachers, mentors, friends, supporters, family, and, and archaeological colleagues. And, and I don't have time to thank you all, but I want you to know I am very much holding you in my thoughts and heart tonight. Um, I will always have such tremendous gratitude for, for everything you have done and continue to do for, for me. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't single out my extraordinary husband, Greg Mumford, also an archaeologist and frequent collaborator. And without his support, uh, the book could not have been written. And the adventures on which the book was based um, uh, would not have happened. Uh, he is and will always be my best archaeological discovery. I found him in Egypt over 20 years ago. Um, I, I have to thank uh, the, the wonderful humans at my publishing house, Henry Holt Macmillan. Um, they believed in the book uh, from the moment we connected years ago. Uh, and I also want to thank my wonderful agent, Steve Ross, who has believed in me from the moment uh, we met. And I finally have to thank our son, Gabriel, who was four when the book was written. Um, and of course, we were reading to him. And now at age eight, he can read it, although I, I think he's more into um, other other books. Uh, he is my past, present, and future wrapped up in, in, into one. Um, we're living in unprecedented times, and for a long time, for, for a whole host of reasons, things have felt pretty hopeless. But with news of a vaccine in the last few weeks, uh, for the first time in a long time, along with lots of other positive news, I think we're all beginning to feel hope again. Um, and I think archaeology gives us a lens through which to see where we've come from and where we might head in troubled times, um, a role to see in multiple pandemics prior to COVID, and how past peoples handled them and recovered from them, whether the plague of Athens in 430 BC or the Black Death in Europe 700, uh, over 700 years ago, uh, that they've given us so many lessons about human resilience and serve as both warnings that this could happen again, but also beacons for how we can adapt and survive. You know, our world will change and is changing in ways we do not expect and at rapid speeds we'll find challenging to predict. But with archaeology, we can see a far broader range of outcomes and possibilities for future survival by studying the diverse ways past cultures were in the world cope, cope with changes of all types from war to climate change, disease, natural disasters. Um, and, and this is typically done not by studying uh, what happened to kings and priests, but through the remnants of everyday people, which is what, of course, my colleagues and I have done and what I tried to describe in Archaeology from Space, how we move from space age technologies to sifting the dirt through our hands. And of course, you know, the, the public tends to see these, these grandiose discoveries or, or things like temples and, and pyramids, which are wonderful. But of course, we were able to tell stories from the detritus of everyday life, from pottery seeds and, and um, uh, soil. And we're able to reconstruct what happened and why and learn what, if anything, survived. And we bring those lessons forward for, for today. Um, you know, the future will be different than we think, but it is not extinction and despair, as so many seem to think it will be, we're going to be resilient in ways we do not yet know or understand fully because that is what past peoples have shown us. It's what we learn through archeology. span Cultures can thrive and grow and power is redistributed more equ equitably. And in cases where there's more egalitarianism, you know, sometimes groups can better survive catastrophes. And this is shown in, in one of the stories I tell in my book, and it's the archeological site behind me, Lish, which was Egypt's capital 3,800 years ago. And after a period of great climate change and collapse in, in the great pyramid age of Egypt, um, and, and about 150 years of pretty shaky, pretty shaky times that are very similar to what we're going through right now, Egypt rose again and, and it sort of we have we celebrate this time period called the Middle Kingdom, which was ancient Egypt Renaissance, and it's this period of great art and architecture and literature. Um, and, and one of the main reasons Egypt was able to thrive and survive is because of economic equality. There are so many lessons for us today, and this is really why I wrote Archaeology from Space um, because I wanted to show that you know that what archaeology can teach us, and that's that humans have this immense capacity for innovation and creativity. And in a world with so many challenges, we have to shed a light. We have to put a spotlight on things that can give us hope. And I think that's, that's what archeology span can do. It shows our humanity. It shows our great 
potential. It shows all of our problems, but also where we could potentially go. And for that, I am so enormously grateful to, um, to, to Phi Beta Kappa and the judges. I feel like you're, you, you didn't just celebrate um, archeology span from space, but you're celebrating the whole field of archeology span and in a moment in our world where things seem so uncertain, a field that stands for rise or allowing the voices of so many hundreds, if not thousands of diverse cultures from around the world and, and shows us better ways of, and different ways of being um, and, and, and something that can give us hope um, that is just so essential. So thank you. I am so enormously grateful. Thank you, Sarah, for uh, inspiring, uplifting words. Uh, I was just thinking that a lot has happened since you and I last spoke when I informed you you were the winner and uh, uh, your smile's a little brighter to, uh, tonight than, uh, than, than, than maybe it was then. There was a little more uncertainty when we last spoke. I, I also will now share with you the one line that I took out of the citation because I just thought it was too bad a pun, but you've now inspired me to, to, to bring it back to the fore. And that as I was going to say, your work gives new meaning to the term bottom-up history, which of course uh, was meant to be a pun about archeology, span but you actually make it in a pr more profound way. Bottom-up history is history told not from the perspective of the kings and the powerful, but from the everyday. Uh, and your space archeology span work very much does that and connects us uh, in a very profound and compelling way. Uh, with our ancient forebears and therefore those who will come after us. Congratulations on winning the Phi Beta Kappa Science Prize. Thank you so much, Fred. The Ralph Waldo Emerson Prize is the youngest of our three book prizes. It was established in 1960 in uh, the name of the great Ralph Waldo Emerson, who, among other things, uh, gave his great, the American scholar, lecture at a Phi Beta Kappa ceremony. It's that reason that we uh, draw that name for our journal, The American Scholar, uh, Emerson, who interestingly enough was not elected to Phi Beta Kappa as an undergraduate at Harvard, but was elected as an honorary member thereafter, and we very much claim him as part of the family. The F Ralph Waldo Emerson Prize recognizes studies that contribute significantly to historical, philosophical, or religious interpretations of the human condition. The winner of the 2020 Phi Beta Kappa Ralph Waldo Emerson Award is Policing the Open Road, How Cars Transformed American Freedom by Sarah Sale, published by Harvard University Press. What is more quintessentially American than a car driving on the open road? And yet, Sarah Sale asks us to see this image through a different and a provocative lens. Not the expression of our freedom, but the emblem of the limitation on our freedoms. Think of it this way. When did you first speak with a police officer? For some of us, it might have been the cop on the beat. But for many of us, I dare say most of us, it was in a car. It's the image of those lights behind you and being pulled over. For a century now, Americans have spent more and more time in our cars. And during that same time, a thicket of police practices and judicial interpretations of the Constitution have led to the creation of a space in which our privacy rights are limited, if indeed existent, and police presence in our lives becomes pervasive. Professor Sayo re-examines well-known doctrines and reveals to us a transformation of American freedom where the automobile plays a surely unintended but just as clearly undeniable role. At a time when cherished concepts such as privacy, freedom, liberty, and equality draw intense scrutiny, policing the open road offers new and powerful insights into how our society got to where we are, which is essential if we are to imagine how we might get to where we aspire to be. Sarah Sayo is a professor at Columbia Law School where she teaches criminal law, criminal procedure, and legal history. In addition to publishing in academic journals, she has written for The Atlantic, The Boston Review, Latin's Quarterly, Le Monde Diplomatique, The New York Review of Books, and The Washington Post. Since the publication of Policing the Open Road, she has been advocating for the removal of civil traffic law enforcement from police duties. Before joining Columbia, 
She spent four years at Iowa Law School. Between law school and graduate school, she clerked on the United States District Court for the Southern District of New York and the United States Court of Appeals for the Second Judicial Circuit. It is my great pleasure to present the Ralph Waldo Emerson Award to Dr. Sarah Sale. And Sarah, by now you know where we're going. You too get a, uh, a wonderful certificate that will be framed and delivered to you. And please share some thoughts with us. Thank you for uh, the honor and for those really kind words um, and above all for engaging with my book. Uh, while I was writing the book, I didn't know if anybody would read it. Um, so in a sense, uh, writing is an act of faith, uh, having faith that somebody will read the words you put on the page. And writing history especially takes a lot of faith. Historians begin their book project at the archives not knowing uh, what she'll find there or whether she'll find anything interesting or even a nugget of a book. The first archives that I visited was at Bancroft Library at Berkeley uh, to look for the papers of August Vollmer, who's widely recognized as the father of modern policing. I didn't expect to find so much in his papers about the problem of traffic. And when I returned from the archives, I was at a loss because I was, uh, traffic is such a boring topic and I didn't know what to make of that. It took more time and more research to discover how important traffic and the history of cars was to the history of modern police. Then the next step was, how do I write about traffic in an interesting way that will actually get readers to read about it? So that was a fun challenge, but writing this book took a lot of faith, uh, which required a lot of support along the way, especially when that faith wavered. And so I wanna thank two people in particular. First, my uh, dissertation advisor, Dirk Hartog at Princeton, where this project beca uh, began as a dissertation prospectus. I also want to thank my husband who made sure that the book wasn't too long and I'm sure many readers thank him as well for that. And I wanna end with a question that a law school student recently asked me. Um, and the question was what I wanted this book to be remembered for. Um, and it's a great question. The core of my argument is that positive laws, that is laws that are enacted for our safety and our well being, but aren't necessarily rooted in morality these sorts of laws are necessary in a modern society and traffic laws are a prime example of that. But these laws also require law enforcement and my co-honorees have uh, mentioned uh, the pandemic and all the, the rules and regulations about locking down and sheltering place are another example of how positive laws require enforcement. But enforcement opens the door to discretionary power and discretion opens the door to discrimination. And this is a quandary that our society has struggled with and is continuing to struggle with. That is the necessity of positive laws on the one hand and the dangers of discretionary power on the other. And this is what my book is all about. As American society became a car society, many people were pulled over for, traffic, for a traffic violation and they experienced discretionary policing. And they asked, what is freedom when uh, they're heavily regulated and policed in the very symbol of their freedom, the automobile? We're still asking and struggling with this question today. Traffic stops are still the most common police encounter and people of color experience more intrusive and violent traffic stops than white people. And these traffic stops often serve as the entry point to the criminal justice system. My hope while writing this book was, and I suppose I can also say that I had to have faith that history can help us figure out what to do today. Um, so thank you for engaging with my book and I really hope that it will um, continue the dialogue about what needs to be done for a more just and equal uh, justice system. Thank you, Sarah, uh, for 
uh, first of all, giving, giving credit to those who helped you along the way and then for the, the power of the project and in some ways putting the, uh, the words in the mouth of the student where we often do some of our most important learning is, is listening to the questions they ask rather than the answers they give to questions that we pose. Uh, in the, uh, if, if, the, if the goal of great scholarship is to try to see the universe in a grain of sand, it's not quite a grain of sand, it's a whole automobile, uh, but it seems like a narrow topic. Traffic, as you say, what could be less interesting than traffic, but it gives you the opportunity to open up whole vistas to us um, that are quite challenging in the whole field of constitutional criminal procedures. And congratulations, and thank you for, for, for sharing your thoughts and words with us. Thank you. So let me remind uh, all of you uh, joining us tonight uh, that if you have uh, questions you'd like to, to have contributed to this discussion, you can put them in the chat. They'll be sent along to me and we'll add them to the conversation. But uh, let's get started now with a couple of questions to, uh, to, to pose to, to each of you. Um, the, the first, and in some ways, um, uh, uh, Sarah has already gotten us a little bit into this one in terms of where the topic came from. Uh, but I, I think most of us experience that the hardest part of a project is coming up with the idea. You know, I've, I was always told that you know, coming up with the, with the project, with the idea for a book, that's half the work. I, I'm not sure, by the way, it's true that it's half the work. There's plenty of work that comes after that. But in some ways, it's the steepest climb to come up with a topic. Uh, I think of the, the um, aphorism attributed to the great Isidore Rabi, uh, Nobel laureate in science, uh, who was asked once, when did you become a scientist? And he said, when I was a little boy and I came home from school, my mother never said to me, Izzy, did you give a good answer today? She always said to me, Izzy, did you ask a good question today? He said, that's when I became a scientist. So something made you all ask these questions. I mean, Leah, look, we're all interested in books. This is Phi Beta Kappa. Uh, but most of us don't write a book about books. Um, so so you know, what, what got this as the, the project? Where did, where did that, that come from? And Sarah, um, uh, we're going to go in the in, in order. Sarah Parsik. I know we have a lot of Sarahs here. Um, the uh, w within archaeology, um, why this particular focus in archaeology? What drove you to this? Uh, and and Sarah uh, Sayo, you did tell us about uh, what got you to to learning about traffic because you bumped into it in the archives. But something got you into those archives. So so where did the project come from? Where did the idea come from for each of you? When did it? sort of come together and say, ah, there's a book in this. So Leah, let me start with you. So I don't want to put words into my fellow panelists' mouths, but it seems to me that all three of us are interested among many other things in a certain kind of dailiness in what fairly humble material kinds of practices or traces can tell us. And for me as a scholar, the most daily of objects is the book. It's the tool that I use to apprehend the world. And so I think for me, it's, it's always been inescapable to think about that tool, to look at that tool rather than looking through that tool at the ideas that it contains. And this is one reason that I was glad that you began with that wonderful quotation from John Hope Franklin, Fred, because Franklin contrasts the material world with the worlds of the mind and the spirit. But it seems to me that in different ways, all three of our projects are bringing together the material world with the world of the mind, whether that's the space age technology and the digging in the dirt, or whether that's thinking of how a very mundane kind of daily object like the automobile is a pivot of very far reaching legal and social changes. So yeah, for me, it really began just as a way of trying to understand the objects 
that I hold in my hands every day as a scholar and also as a pleasure reader. But over to you, Sarah. Well, I, I just want to say quickly that uh, for, for those listening uh, in tonight, uh, uh, Leah is not a plant on this, uh, but the one of the challenges that I always set for myself every year at the Book Award dinner is to show the common threads among the, the three winners. Uh, and I always tell the recipients when I congratulate them when I first tell them they win, that the connections will emerge. They'll, you'll see the thing will reveal itself. This is the first time anybody ever did my job for me. Uh, Leah, you, 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 you put the thread right through uh, the through line through the three works and, and did it beautifully. Um, Sarah, what, uh, what, what would you tell us about you know, where all this digging in the dirt comes from? So I, I think for, for me, you know, I've, I've always loved, um, I've always loved the dirt, I've always loved exploring um and i it was about four or five years ago uh a friend said gosh you should really write a book uh you know a, a popular science book about what you do and and i said to my friend well that's i'm really glad you think that um uh, but it's not that easy um but i i was out with my husband on a on a on a date night and i have to credit um our our wonderful local one of our wonderful local restaurants, Chez Fon Fon, and I may have had uh, more than one adult beverage. And I, the idea just came to me. Um, and, and the reason it did, it, it, and kind of connecting to some of Leah's points about the, the dailiness of, of the work that, that she and Sarah and I do, um, I was talking to my husband and hemming and hawing, going, gosh, a book, like what could I possibly do my, my work is so nerdy how, how could I make make it something that the general public would want to read and we're in this very crowded intimate space and everyone's talking and, and amidst the warmth and and the the humming and the closeness and seeing all of these humans interact it just hit me you know, our archaeologists, I mean, at, at our core, we're basically gossips, right? We're telling these intimate, intricate stories of how different peoples existed and looking around the room and seeing this, the, the, the different ways that everybody was connecting with each other. And it was so heartwarming and, and so joyous. Um, and I'm, I'm dreaming of the days that we can get back to doing this soon but that's at the core of of what archaeology does and what it teaches us it's all about human connection it's all about the the different as i said in my in my little speech the different ways of of being and even though archaeology the a lot of the work i do is very high tech and, and you know that satellites help to show us where to explore and help show the the extent and scale of human settlement, ultimately, we have to get out on the ground, we have to excavate, we have to explore. And it's it's about the stories. It's about who we are. It's, it's ultimately about what makes us human, right? That's the windmill at which archaeologists tilt constantly. Um, and and it's, it's both fixed and ever changing. You know, our common humanity has not changed in the 300,000 years that we've been human. I, I think if we were to travel back in time, we would find um, the, the, the peoples who lived in sub-Saharan Africa were not altogether too different for, from us, even though we think we're, we're modern, um, we're still the same. And that's really what made me want to write archaeology from space to show this grand scale of, of all the different ways we've existed and, and to shed a spotlight on all the wonderful work that my colleagues have done all over the world and the great potential that archaeology has um, for, for teaching us. And it all started in, in that restaurant, you know, understanding that the core of what I do and the core of what my colleagues do is about human connection and that feeling of warmth and excitement and, and gratitude. Um, so, so that's really what I, that, that's, that's what, that's what drove me to, to write the book. And the timing of when it comes out in some ways is, is perfect in that I'm sure I'm not the only one who had the experience uh, during this pandemic of feeling much more connected with the ancients uh, because the arrogance of our time of thinking that we've outgrown certain things and we've moved past certain things, boy, we sure don't feel that way right now in the time we're living through. You know, you hear about plagues past, but this was our plague present. So hearing how people have dealt with those plagues uh, a thousand years ago or a hundred thousand years ago tells us something about people who share a lot of our DNA. Uh, we're, uh, we're dealing with some of the same problems. Uh, so Sarah, what got you interested in cops? 
Well, interestingly, in law school, I wasn't interested in criminal law or procedure. Um, and the interest came while I was clerking uh, for two federal judges right after graduating from law school. And I noticed that uh, the criminal docket was about a third of the docket, um, and most of the criminal cases um, involved drug cases. And so I wanted to know, and a, a lot of the defendants uh, in these drug cases were people of color. Um, and I was just uh, surprised that uh, most of the criminal cases that came through federal courts in New York were uh, drug cases. And I wanted to know more about the history on the war on drugs. And it's a huge topic, so I focused on law enforcement and the war on drugs. And as a legal historian, there's really a, one major constitutional amendment that governs what the police do, and that's the Fourth Amendment. And for those of you who aren't familiar with the Fourth Amendment, it guarantees um, your security against unreasonable searches and seizures. And so a seizure is whenever a, a police officer uh, stops you, um, either in a car traffic stop or on the street, that's a seizure under the Fourth Amendment. And so that's really the first moment in the citizen or individual police encounter. Um, and so the Fourth Amendment governs that first moment. And it's really the only constitutional provision that regulates what the police can and cannot do. So I began my research um, I, I technically the first archives was not the Bancroft archives. That was, Bancroft was the first archives I traveled to, but the first archives was Westlaw. Uh, I plugged in Fourth Amendment and started reading all Fourth Amendment cases from the very beginning of US history. Um, and I was surprised that Fourth Amendment cases were really rare um, in the 18th and 19th centuries. Uh, some years there were none at all in state or federal courts. Um, there were uh, some decades, there were a few, um, and this was true for both state and federal courts. And, and the number of Fourth Amendment cases exploded to hundreds suddenly in the 1920s. And when I started reading these Fourth Amendment cases, a common theme was cars. These are car stops and searches. And so that's when, and by that point, when I had uh, made this realization about the timing of uh, Fourth Amendment cases, I had um, that was after my trip to the uh, uh, Bancroft archives. Um, and so the, the focus on traffic and the explosion of car, uh, Fourth Amendment cases with the uh, mass production of cars um, was starting to make sense, it was starting to click. And, and when I really delved into these early Fourth Amendment cases, I realized that the justification for expanding the police's authority to search cars for pro, uh, alcohol. This was also um, a coinciding factor was prohibition in the 1920s. Um, to justify the police to stop cars to search them for liquor, uh, the basis for that or the justification for that authority was their authority, uh, was the state's authority to regulate traffic. So all of these threads were coming together. Um, and so that's how it really began with noticing um, the prevalence of drug cases um, in our society today. Um, and of course, in my book, I end with the war on drugs. So uh, Sarah knows I, I teach criminal procedure at Georgetown Law School. Um, and it is, it is essentially an American history course that, that also teaches some constitutional doctrine because you're talking about bootlegging and the war on drugs and uh, uh, the war on terrorism and all the different issues that come up all get refracted through the through the Fourth Amendment. Um, I got a couple of questions that have come in, so let me uh, let me ask those, and then I've uh, got a few more of my own that I'm going to. Uh, so uh, this is for Leah Price. Um, uh, it's, uh, you say in your book that if you, uh, if you care about the future of the deep, sustained engagement with lasting truths that a few books have long sparked in a few readers, then the threat you should be worried about isn't the Kindle. So this questioner says, uh, we all do care about that future, uh, but if it isn't the Kindle that threatens such engagement with lasting truths, what is it? Part of what I try to make a case for in this book is thinking about the practices that matter, the ways of thinking and acting that matter, rather than assuming that if a certain kind of object 
is in our hands, those ways of thinking and acting will automatically follow. And so maybe turning that question back on to, again, the rest of the panel, I'm curious about what my fellow panelists feel you've done with the book format that you couldn't have done with short form pieces, with journal articles, mm -hmm. with TED Talks, with popular journalism. You, you are both people who, ha who work in a wide range of genres and to formulate your ideas for a range of different audiences in a range of different media and different forms. So without wanting to dodge the question, I would love to hear from both Sarah's what you think the book form allowed you to do intellectually and what you think it's going to allow, it's allowing, it's allowed your readers to do that wouldn't have been the case if you had worked in a different medium. It's a nice question. What what requires something to be a book uh, book project? You know, Faulkner actually started as a poet, um, and his poetry was okay, but not great. Um, and part of it is he knew this was not what it was going to work for him, and he tried different uh, forms. And obviously, he found his genius and his form in the novel. But it took him a while to get to it. We're we're lucky he did. Um, so uh, so uh, the two the two Saras um, thoughts about why a book and not a, um, a long article in the, I don't know, a fine periodical like the American Scholar. I'll, Sarah, would you like to, to go, go first? You're welcome to. Or I, I, I'll jump in. I, so I guess for, for, for me, the, I, I guess I'll frame it in, in, in um, something I think about a, a lot. And that is, you know, I'm as, as a storyteller, when did storytelling start? And of course it started, I mean, it's been around since, I mean, not just our species, right? I think it goes back in time, Neanderthals, whenever, whenever our, our ancestors could talk, they told stories or they sung or they communicated with each other. And I think the difference between say a, um, a, a short form piece uh, and a book is the difference between um, a night telling stories around the campfire and getting through a long winter with many stories told over time that build and sort of nestle and become a, a code uh, and a way for existing and being. Um, that's at least the, 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 the journey that I wanted to take my readers on. And one, as, as a writer um, that, that I had to learn, I, I wrote an academic book prior to this one. That was my only experience book writing and an academic book is not a popular science book. So I had to learn how to create this arc and how to take uh, my readers with me. And, and of course you do that in any form of writing, but the idea that you're on this journey and you're the, the gentle guide um, and you're letting your readers discover all these things for themselves along the way. And it's a grand adventure. Um, and then they're left with lasting lessons. To, to me, that's what, that's, what, that, that's what a book does. Remember an editor of mine with each draft saying more stories, more stories. Um, uh, but what he said to me, I was thinking of what you were just saying now, is that we are a storytelling species. In fact, we are a storytelling genus. That's probably what distinguishes us uh, from, from other mammals, uh, the thumb too, but uh, that we, we have language and that we, we talk in stories. Uh, uh, Sarah Seo, I'm gonna, gonna ask you a different question to take you off the hook on this one. Uh, uh, you, we got a, a question that came in that asks whether you, have con you connect your work in some ways um, with Michelle Alexander's uh, pathbreaking work, The New Jim Crow. The question is whether I um, discuss her book in my book or well, how my how, scholarship. Well, how, how, you, how you see yourself in, in dialogue with her work or how you see what you're doing uh, related to it. I mean, I, I would sure. say, you know, my own take is that your work and her work are not siblings, but your cousins. Um, so I, I don't know if that, if that resonates with your take on it. So I'll begin with um, 
my belief as a historian that what we do um, is to explain how we got from A to B in chronological order. Um, and it's and history is not monocausal, but multi-causal. There's so many causes that explain how we got to where we are today. Um, and so Michelle Alexander provides one explanation or causal explanation for uh, mass incarceration. Um, and I provide another um, causal explanation and a very different one at that. So Michelle Alexander focuses on the severe laws, uh, drug laws and sentencing laws um, that were passed um, in the latter uh, 20th century that explain uh, mass incarceration today. My book offers a very different explanation. Um, it starts in the early 20th century with cars and very uh, provocatively or controversially, I argue that um, the police, uh, modern policing um, started and the police's discretionary, inordinate discretionary power began with the need to regulate traffic. Um, and in the early 20th century, when cars were just um, becoming um, mass adopted by American society, most people who owned and drove cars were not people of color. They were too poor to, to buy one. Um, they were white people. They were well-to-do white people. And so really modern policing, I argue, had its uh, uh, roots in the need to discipline, regulate, and police white people who drove cars and refused to obey traffic laws. Um, and so it's, it's, it offers a, a different explanation. I don't uh, disagree with Ms. Michelle Alexander's. I think it's, it's an, uh, it adds to her account, um, but it's a different account for sure. And ultimately how I connect um, the policing of the white, I call um, every man um, um, because um, uh, a lot of, um, early at car advertisements uh, referred to the everyman. This is a car for every man. Um, in legal papers, the everyman was referred to as a law abiding citizen. Why does a law abiding citizen violate traffic laws? This was a big problem. Um, and so my book tries to explain how we got from the, the need to police every man or the law abiding citizen to how uh, uh, to the end point of how uh, the, the po police power came to focus on uh, people of color in their cars driving while black, for example. And so that's kind of the, the, the narrative arc that I tell in my book. Uh, Sarah Parsec, I've got a really interesting uh, ethics of archeology span question that came in for you. Uh, but before I ask you that, uh, I do wanna ask our raffle question. So uh, everyone uh, get, get ready for the raffle question. Remember the first three correct answers uh, will, will win a prize. So the raffle question is, what federal agency did Phi Beta Kappa help to found in 1965? What federal agency did Phi Beta Kappa help to found in 1965? You see, that's not true. That's Phi Beta Kappa history. That's a, this is important stuff. So first three correct answers, uh, put it in the chat uh, and, uh, and you will be, uh, will be our winners. So um, while, you're, while you're all working on that, Sarah, here's one for you. Uh, one of our uh, participants tonight asks, uh, what do you see as some of the greatest ethical stumbling blocks or pitfalls that archaeologists face when it comes to using remote uh, sensing data? That's a great question. And actually, I, um, I wrote a, an op-ed for the New York Times about a year ago um, discussing the ethics of remote sensing generally, um, more specifically, uh, some, some mentions for archaeology. And that was uh, around the time that our um, uh, soon to be former President Trump um, released a, uh, an image of a missile launch site in Iran. Very naughty of him. He took a picture and it revealed our essentially technological capacity for uh, imaging. Uh, and his was a low resolution screenshot. Um, and it showed that we have the ability to image anywhere in the world um, at a resolution of five centimeters per pixel or better. That means things that are about this big or smaller can be seen. I think it's much smaller. So yeah, I, I think we have a real duty of care um, when we're considering any kind of remotely sensed images. And, and the main issue, of course, is um, 
that in so many cases, these are archeological sites, not in the sense of in the past, but these are places that are still honored revered and lived in by indigenous peoples today that are deeply connected to or part of the same people or groups that made them hundreds if not thousands of years ago. And, and those peoples did not consent to be imaged and they did not consent to have those sites imaged. So I think there's a lot um, that we can learn from whether it's informed consent or for trying to connect with people in those communities, but we have Google Earth imagery for the whole planet almost. Um, and I, I think we have to be very careful. Um, certainly one of the big issues that my colleagues and I face, you know, when we're sharing information, and this is often oftentimes when I'm working with collaborators in country. So these are indigenous archeologists. Um, they're very excited about the data. We're excited about the data, but we can't publish the coordinates of the sites that we find because of course they could potentially be looted. So there's a tension between wanting to discover sites because a country can't protect sites um, from, from destruction unless they know where they are versus making sure that the, the data isn't released um, so that you know looters and, and other folks that might destroy them uh, will, will attack them. So these are things we think about very deeply and very carefully. Um, you know, it's something I, I think a lot about, especially I, I run a citizen archaeology crowdsourcing platform that allows the world to look at satellite images. And we work very closely with the governments to make sure that, you know, those, those sites are protected. So let me, let me ask you each a question that is actually based on something I typically say when I uh, speak at Phi Beta Kappa induction ceremonies, including the virtual ones we did this year. Uh, where I was able to be at about a, a dozen of them, some, sometimes a uh, thousand miles apart and the two in the same day. There are certain advantages to this uh, strange time in which we're living. So one of the things I always say to the, the students who are being inducted is even though I haven't met them, um, by dint of the fact that they're sitting there, I know three things about them. Uh, one is that they have uh, gotten themselves to a, one of the 290 schools that's got a Phi Beta Kappa chapter. The second is they obviously challenged themselves academically, performed at the highest level. Uh, and from those two, three, those two things, I can infer a third, which is that they have been deeply blessed. That, that somewhere along the line, somebody, parent, friend, teacher, somebody said the right word at the right time that, that opened a door, that sent them in a certain direction, that said something is possible. Um, and I have to tell you, when I do this at uh, the ceremonies, uh, the live ones or the virtual ones, you can look around the room or the screen and you can tell people are doing it. You, you, you can see it in their eyes. They're, they're, they're picturing the person. So, um, so that's what I want to ask each of you. If there's a somebody who, as you think on it, um, played that kind of a role, maybe it's a couple of people. Um, could be somebody early on. Could be a mentor, thesis advisor. Could be somebody later on. Um, connected with this book or not necessarily. Connected with your academic career or somebody who made it clear to you that you could be a, a scholar, that you could be a a published author. So I, I wonder if, uh, and nobody's going to want to go first on this one. So as a law professor, I'm skilled at cold calling if I have to. Um, um, I don't know, why, why don't we go in reverse order for where, where, where we started? Uh, I think Sarah Sio knew this was coming, and then Sarah Parsak and uh, Leah Price. Uh, Sarah, was there somebody who said the right word at the right time, turned the key, and you said to yourself, you know, I could be I could be more than I thought I could be. There were so many people in my life like that. Um, and so in, in the interest of time, I'll just name two people. Um, one is a college professor, Christine Stanzel. Uh, I also went to Princeton for undergrad and she taught history there. Um, and I took as many history classes I, as I could with her. Um, and I had never considered academia, I'd never considered even being a historian until uh, she um, talked to me on, on graduation day. Um, she was on the committee that awarded senior thesis prizes and she had, um, and the study for the program of women and gender studies. Now it's called gender and sexuality studies. And back then it was women's studies. Um, uh, she came to me and said, you know, your thesis, um, could really get you into a graduate school program for history. Um, and later in grad school, uh, when I was feeling um, 
like uh, I, I couldn't think creatively um, uh, as required for the discipline of history to write really great history. She um, she again told me uh, you do think creatively. You you do you can write. You can do this, and so she encouraged me at several points in my academic career. Uh, the second person is my mother, um, who actually never went to college. Um, my family immigrated to uh, this country from South Korea when I was five years old. Um, and so, um, and my father was the only one in my family who could speak English when we immigrated. My mom knew not a single word. Um, and of course I was five years old and I didn't either. Um, and so my mother and I learned together. Um, she, uh, she helped me prepare for my history exams, all sorts of exams. She uh, cracked open a chemistry book with me. Um, and I really uh, learned um, the love of learning and I learned my curiosity about the world from her because that just, that's who she is. Um, and she's been my number one encourager. Um, and, and so those are the two people that um, I, I don't think I could be here without them in my life. Beautiful, thank you. I have a mother like that. I, I know that feeling. That's the that's a greatest blessing there is after all. Uh, Sarah? Wow. Yeah, you could see me thinking. <laughs> there are so many. I, I've been so blessed with so many people at so many different points in my life and, and career. I guess I'll start with the oldest um, or the earliest and end with one of the most recent. Um, so, so much of what I do um, as a scientist, as a scholar, and, and how I exist as a teacher, as a professor, and as a human being is because of my grandfather. Uh, Harold Young, he was a forestry professor at the University of Maine in Orono, um, and he was one of the pioneers in using aerial photographs in forestry, he was a forestry professor. So he, um, it's funny, I, I've been able to, with, with Google Scholar, look up a lot of his early papers, and I don't know if it's, 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 it's it's possible to plagiarize via DNA because our writing is very similar and I didn't know that. And, and our words are virtually identical when we're talking about the applications of these new technologies to our respective fields. Um, so he's the reason I took my first remote sensing class as an under, undergraduate at, at Yale. Um, you know, at that point, unfortunately he passed away due to, 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 to cancer, but I thought, well, gosh, my grandfather was able to use aerial photos and forestry. And I grew up listening to him tell me all these amazing stories and being outside in the woods and learning about respecting nature and exploring. You know, I bet loads of people have used um, satellites to, to, you know, map archaeological sites, but, you know, it'll be fun to learn what my grandfather did in a new, in a new way. And um, I found out that virtually no one had applied it to Egypt and that opened up a new world. Um, so I feel like I carry him with me. In fact, on, on our mantle, um, I have one of my most treasured photographs, which is my grandfather looking through um, uh, a, 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 um, looking down in 3D at, um, at overlapping aerial photos. Um, and it's sort of the equivalent to me looking at my computer screen. Um, the, the other person that I think um, helped to, to inspire me to, to do more and, and to be more was my first mentor um, at the University of Alabama at Birmingham, where I teach. And that's a, a, an amazing human named Tennant McWilliams. He was the longtime dean of the School of Social and Behavioral Sciences, now the College of Arts and Sciences. And from the moment I met him in my job interview, um, goodness, almost um, 15 years ago, he saw something in me that I couldn't see in myself. And that was um, someone who could be a leader in science. And he believed in me, he supported me um, with such grace and humanity. Um, and his, his only rule was that I would continuously pay it forward for the rest of my career. He helped me to start my lab um, and he's been a dear friend since. So it's really my grandfather and, and tenant that I'm here to, tonight. Beautiful. I love the image of the uh, of the of the, the the picture and the sort of uh, sensory uh, device from outer space to the extent that he could come up with that in his generation. Um, yeah, the uh, I don't know if there's I don't think you can plagiarize the DNA. I think you can just be inspired. Uh, and it's pretty powerful stuff. Uh, Leah. 
So like my two co-panelists, I'm daunted by this question because of all the people whom it's impossible to name. Um, I learned to do research in book history by teaching book history. And as a literary critic who always had fantasies of being a historian, the same way some dogs think that they're human or um, literary critics these days tend to want to be something else. And some of us wish we were cognitive psychologists. Some of us wish we were political activists. Some of us wish we were philosophers. I've always wished to be a historian and I learned how to fake it better uh, by spending the past couple of decades uh, co-teaching classes, both undergraduate and graduate, with two colleagues at my former university, Harvard, uh, Anne Blair and Jill Lepore. And I've learned so much from them about how to read and how to teach that helped me also think about how to write. So that's an experience whose intellectual dividends I still feel every day, even though I've now moved to a different university and a different city. And at a moment when taking the train a few hours north feels impossible, in some ways we feel very far away. In other ways, every time I write, every time I read, I feel that I'm channeling their intellectual generosity. And the other category of gratitude that I feel, which I can't put a whole catalog of names to, is all the librarians, both in public libraries and in special collections, who have taught me about how to see books, how to observe books, how not just to look through them, to use them as a kind of optical device, like a pair of glasses, but not just how to see through books, but also how to look at books as carriers of the labor that went into their making and as carriers of the human relationships that go into the preservation and transmission and discoverability of books. So um, although I can't give an exhaustive list of everyone in that category, I would just say that like many scholars at some points I've had the fantasy of, I found this, I stumbled on this, I discovered this book, but I've never actually found it or stumbled upon it because there is always a long line of librarians who have put the book on the shelf and put the book in the catalog and described the book in ways that made it recognizable to me as something good to think with. And you, you may or may not know uh, that, uh, that Jill Lepore herself is a prior winner of a Phi Beta Kappa Book Award. She won the Ralph Waldo Emerson Prize for her work, uh, The Name of War. Um, so uh, you're 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 channeling her here as as well, uh, and uh, in in the Phi Beta Kappa Awards. So there are just a few very uh, happy tasks that are left to me. First of all, I want to congratulate the uh, the winners of our of our raffle. The correct answer uh, answers. Uh, uh, we were, we were most thinking of the National Endowment for the Humanities, but we certainly would have given full credit for the National Endowment for the Arts when uh, Phi Beta Kappa was. Uh, involved with the Council of Graduate Colleges of America, as well as the American Council of Learned Societies. Uh, we were partners in a convening that led to the enabling legislation at the time for the national endowments 
that were split into the two uh, national endowments for the arts and the humanities. We're still deeply engaged in advocating and championing both endowments and seeking uh, funding for those. Uh, we know from the remarks of President Johnson at the time of signing that enabling legislation uh, that he said that a great society, which was the term he used for his social welfare projects, uh, also was measured by how it treated its humanists and how it treated its artists and what it meant to the culture of the society. So, um, so NEA and NEH uh, were both, uh, both good answers. If you're not one of the first three and you got, the, you got it right, then uh, congratulations on knowing Phi Beta Kappa history. Um, I, I also, before another last word of congratulations to our recipients, have one other task to accomplish. Um, and that is we have a tradition uh, since Lynn uh, took on her term as president of Phi Beta Kappa. Uh, the, the, the anniversary of Phi Beta Kappa on December 5th is not our only celebration around now. Uh, December 8th happens to be Lynn's birthday. So for the last two years, we have sung happy birthday to Lynn at these events. Those of you who have heard happy birthday or anything else for that matter, uh, being sung not by professionals in a, a remote setting, they know it is cacophony and it is not to be tried by amateurs. So we will not try it tonight on the, on the understanding that next year, uh, and Peter Quimby, who I think is with us uh, tonight, uh, who will be Lynn's successor as president as of this coming summer. I'm sure Peter will consent, Lynn, that at next year's dinner, uh, Phi Beta Kappa Awards, uh, Book Awards dinner, uh, we will owe you one and we'll sing you happy birthday a year from now, but happy, happy birthday. Thank and may so be a sweet much. and Thank a healthy you. new year uh, for you coming. Um, and to our three recipients, I saved this little insight all the way to the end. This is the first time in our history that all three book uh, awards have gone to women. Um, I didn't want to lead with that because it seems to me that's not really what the story is about. I wanted the story to emerge from the three of you. Um, I think it did. Uh, I think this was a very special night and to have all three of you uh, representing the highest values of the liberal arts and sciences uh, made this a, uh, a wonderful occasion. Uh, thank you uh, for sharing your work with us and allowing us to honor you. Uh, we look forward to continuing to to follow your work. You're now members of the Phi Beta Kappa family, whether you like it or not. Uh, and, we, and we cherish the members of the Phi Beta Kappa family. Congratulations to all of you. Thank you all for being with us tonight. Uh, I wish you a happy and healthy holiday season, uh, a sweet and a healthy new year uh, for you and your families and for this whole society and, and poor planet that could use some healing in the new year. Um, uh, good night or good afternoon or good morning, uh, and thank you for being with us for the 2020 Phi Beta Kappa Book Award event.